together for the most fantastic, gorgeous, lovely award, and I love him, Lucas Howard! <laughs> amazing faces. I've been sat with my back to you most of the evening, so it's just like I'm just taking it all in. It's lovely. Oh. <laughs> um, I handed you guys out some um, bits of paper with what does it mean to be a man on. Um, some people like straight away know the answer, what, what it is to be a man. Some people just straight away, they know what it is and that's what it is. Other people don't want to answer because they don't feel like they want to commit to it. Other people are a bit afraid. Of, of trying to answer this because they don't want to step on anyone's toes. It's, it's difficult. It's a difficult question. Um, and there's no complete answer to it. I haven't found a complete answer to it and I'm pretty sure that no one else could because once you do, there's going to be someone else who has a different interpretation. Um, two of the, I'm going to read out two of the things um, that people have, have written down tonight. The first one was being eaten alive by a feminist poet. That's what being a man is. <laughs> Um, if that's the case, I am a man, because it has happened to me. I was in Camden um, with a couple of friends of mine doing Slam, and I had one that was... Um, I've actually edited it since to save this problem from happening again, but it was, it was called um, Slam Poet. And it's going through all the different types of stereotypes and stuff like that. And I was, I was, I was basically sending up the types of people who view feminists in a very um, sort of stupid way, I suppose. And, but I was doing it in character. But before I got a chance to finish and to reveal what I was doing, uh, five women in the audience decided to heckle me to death <laughs> and then to the point where the person comparing had to apologise for, for my bigotry uh, to everyone. And um, yeah, I was, I was, yeah, so um, please don't do that to me tonight. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, I also asked people on FB, on, on Facebook and social media, what it means. Um, the most common ones were um, a male over 18, um, in possession of a winky, was very, was very popular, and uh, not a woman. Um, so you could, obviously you can argue all of those points, but I suppose in some way they are true as well. Um, and what I, I really like this one, being someone's rock. Um, I, I think that that's genderless. I think being someone's rock is just about being a dependable person. Um, Emma is totally my rock, and I'm, I'm pretty sure she's not a man. Um, so, um, I would have found out by now. Um, and being kind, of course, this is, this is genderless as well. We could, we could go on. People, people like to reverse the idea of what a man is from being hard, being distant, all these things, to being positive. But in doing so, you make it genderless, because that is just being a virtuous person, just being a good person. Um, I've been working at Westfield Trees recently, and I told the guys about what I was doing, about talking to people, about doing this set. And um, the whole time I was doing it, like working with them, every time they fell the tree or did anything, like, they're like, that's a man, Lucas, that's what a man does, that's what a man does. Like the whole time I was just thinking, like, a strong woman, physically strong woman, could do exactly what they do, but without the casual misogyny, you know? And it was, it was constant, it was constant. And casual misogyny is something that, like, it, you could be the most, like, you could be the most feministy person in the world, but if you surround yourself with people who are all doing that thing, you find yourself doing it, and, and, and not just doing it, but doing it and not even thinking about it. And I think we all, we all do this. Like, um, up at the gym, some people come up to me and talk to me in ways I would never usually talk, and I find myself responding in a way that I don't like. And then I think about it later, and I'm like, you're a fucking arsehole. Like, why did you just tell him to be a fucking, to fuck up, you know? So, <laughs> next time, I will. Um, okay, um, George West, wow. Uh, George West saw, sent me an essay about gender. Um, and it was basically, he, he's very into this Marxist angle of gender is a product of division of labour. And the idea is um, that men are physically stronger, so they can do jobs that women can't do, and because of that they've been put up higher on the social uh, bracket than women. And obviously that's something that still exists, and, and everyone can see that it exists, but people are starting to realise that it's that we can move past it. And I'm, I'm starting to feel that. Um, another an, another like, uh, a thing that someone um, said, and do you remember Alex Vellis? Does anyone remember Alex Vellis? 
very good poet. I think he was here the second slam dunk. Um, he sent me a poem, and I'm going to perform it for you now. This is called I Am Man. I am man. I wake up each morning, make a cup of tea for me and the missus. Go downstairs, quick piss, do the dishes. You don't like the smell of bleach, so I clean the kitchen. I make less money than you because I work less and my job is easier. I hate work just as much as you, though. 3 a.m. and we hear YOLO bellow, bellowed through paper thin walls by I skip leg day and it's painfully obvious guys, who think it's all about upper bodies, not thighs. Trust me, Bob. Bitches love upper bodies. Trust me, bro. We didn't pull because there are feminazis everywhere. Actually, mate, that is a common misconception. Your preconceived detection of feminazis is at best inaccurate. Maybe you're just not her cup of tea or coffee. No one's ju judging. Knuckle jaggers. Bro, you're a faggot. Shouldn't you be at home wanking into a sock? This is lads on tour, bruv. Lads on tour! Actually, I am a man. I don't need Jaeger bombs to quantify who I am. I am man. I don't need a medal for most visits to the STD clinic because I am man. I don't need to belittle other people. I am man. What a man is to me is a lover, a carer, a friend, a saviour, a protector. What a woman is to me, a lover, a carer, a friend, a saviour, a protector. Don't feel admonished if you don't fit in. You will do. I think it's an age thing, or possibly not being a bastard thing. <laughs> I am man, and I am not ashamed of who I am. Hear me roar, or rather grunt, or more likely complain. Hear me snore, I am rather blunt and slightly insane. But I am proud, and I am man. And I can be condescending and a well of despair. I can be antagonistic, infantile and scared. I can be abrupt. I am neither proud nor ashamed to have a penis. My birthright is not to be king. And just because you feel empowered for having a vagina, that does not make you a queen. You can stand, by, you can stand at my side, in front or behind, but you are my, my equal. I am man and I am human. I am not really sure what that means anymore but I will do my best to be the best person I can be. Um, the reason why I chose to, to read that out um, was because it agrees with almost everything that I do. Um, and I believe that gender is not binary. Um, I believe that we're all women, we're all men. Um, apart from, obviously, our junk, which is different. Um, but that doesn't mean that that, that doesn't mean we think any differently. Um, we're not born thinking differently. There's been a lot of... Um, does anyone here read New Scientist magazine? No one. Okay, just me. <laughs> um, they, they've revealed recently there's been a, an extensive study showing that there are two different types of brain. Uh, there, are, there is no gender, gender difference when it comes to brain. And that actually, it's the way your brain grows from a baby, so it's, it's culture, and it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not something you're born with. It's how your brain grows, to, and that's dependent on your environment. So um, the expectations is what we become, and I believe that as well. Although there are probably lots of people who disagree with it, and that's fine. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip down. I did have a presentation, by the way, with loads of visuals and stuff, but never mind, it's cool, next time. Um, language shaping reality. Okay, so the language we use, as I said, like, uh, it, it shapes everything around us. And we find ourselves saying things like men can't multitask and better spatial awareness, stuff like that. And it is a load of crap. Like, it is actually a load of crap. Um, men can do these things because they apart say they can do those things. Out apart from washing. Actually, someone did put that. I do hang out washing. It's two exclamation marks. I forgot to say that. Um, like, for example, do you know, has anyone here ever been called a mummy's boy? Thank you. It's very brave of you to say so. Because it's not a nice thing to be called, is it? It's not nice. It's like, it's emasculating, saying that you can't look after yourself in a way that you need. And I've noticed this, is there seems to be a, a negative connotation to men needing help from women, especially women, um, for some reason. I don't know why. 
Um, but the other, on the other hand, daddy's girl doesn't have the same negative connotations at all. Um, so looking at language and when you're using language, I um, mean the same way that when someone comes up to me in the gym and talks to me, being conscious about what you're saying is, is, is where to start, I think. Okay, I've talked loads, I haven't, I've done, like, I haven't even done one of my poems yet. Um, okay, so uh, I was inadvertently part of the uh, feminist music movement, and I did like loads of uh, feministy things like going to uh, Green Common and stuff like that when I was like four or five years old, because my mum was a feminist, and all of the women around her were feminists. Um, I loved all of the female attention, absolutely loved it, and I loved the feminine energy, and I trusted women a lot more than I trusted men. Um, but until one day a woman said to me, you're going to grow up to be the enemy. And that fucked with my head because I was like, suddenly I didn't want to grow up. I don't want to be the enemy. I don't want to, I want to be, I want to be this woman's friend. This is called the enemy. When I was a boy, I was told that I would grow up to be the enemy. When my mum left my birth dad for fear of her own safety, he was the enemy. When my mum stole my granddad's box of porn magazines and he chased our van down the street, he was the enemy. When my stepdad failed to connect with me, he was a person working through his own issues. I just found it hard to see that at the time. And so I pulled the tiger's tail because that's what monkeys do. And he growled because that's what tigers do. There is no enemy, just individuals trying their best to live with the lies they are told until the cracks in the mould are too big to ignore. If you want to try and make me feel small, the choice is yours. But I refuse to fight. It leaves me empty and distraught. I have no need in my life for an enemy anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Talking about language, um, this, before I'd even really started writing poetry, this, this phrase came into my head, and it was, I know not why, but I despise men in tightly knotted ties. And I, I love the cadence of it, it's nice, it flows. Um, but um, it later became a poem, and I used this poem because I didn't, at the time I didn't want to talk about these issues, I was a little bit scared of, 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 of what people would think. So I disguised my message in a nonsense poem, and I called it Men in Ties. I know not why, but I despise Men with tightly knotted ties. And men who always tie their ties far too loose and far too wide. Men who walk around in socks and men who wear their suits to shops and men who prefer to wear frocks and funny, fancy, frilly tops. Men who dust and clean their shelves and men who barely clean themselves and leave behind revolting smells in places that they choose to dwell. I would not care if or when I never saw a man again, but of course it does not help that I'm a fucking man myself. <laughs> I guess, I guess I was lucky not to have really strong like gender separations at home. Although, even even though my parents had strong principles around these issues, I still felt I could still still see their parents' attitudes coming through them without them even realising. And I I probably do the same. Um, but at school, I noticed there was a lot more pressure. Um, there was a lot of pressure on women to be attractive, a lot of pressure on men to be cool. And I was definitely not cool. I was like the antithesis of cool. Um, I was the weird kid, um, which is cool when you're at uni. It's not so cool when you're at school. Um, this, is, uh, this, is my, this is my way of taking charge of this. And this is the first rap I ever wrote when I was a teenager. Um, it was called Just Ain't Cool, and I was like, I'm going to own this, I'm going to own not being cool. And what I want you guys to do, is I want you to join, join in with, with me on the chorus, and the chorus goes, I'll say it, then you say it. So it's, I just ain't cool, I just ain't cool, I don't know why, but I just ain't cool. Your turn. I just ain't cool, I just ain't cool, I just ain't cool. Perfect. You got it. I was going to do it again, but you got it perfect first time, so that's fine. Okay, this is called Just Ain't Cool. I'm hyped tonight, because I got a hot date. I said I'd pick her up about quarter past eight, but the bus drives past as I close the gate. Now I've got a walk and I'm going to be late. As I walk on, it starts to rain. Another date where I turn up wet again. 
Finally get there about quarter past nine with a soggy box of chocolates and a bottle of wine. As she opens the door, I say, girl, you look fine. Go to give her a kiss and drop the wine. She says, boy, you haven't got a clue. You're not my type and you just stay cool. I just stay cool. I just stay cool. I don't know why, but I just stay cool. So it's Saturday and I'm lazing in the park, watching all the girls as they walk past. As I'm laying there, a ball rolls up to me, so I jump up to kick it gracefully, knowing full well there's a girl watching me. But I look in horror as I see the ball fly straight through the sky and hit that girl right in the eye. A guy nearby says, look at that ball. Did you see what he did? That just ain't cool. I just ain't cool. I just ain't cool. I don't know why, but I just ain't cool. So it's Saturday night now, and I've just come from a pub, waiting in line to get in a club. As I'm standing there, a limo pulls up and the guy gets out, is well scrubbed up. He's wearing shiny shoes and a brand new tux and he walks right in like he doesn't give a fuck. Now I'm not fond of dressing up like James Bond. Changing's long, so I go out and what I've got on. The bouncer takes one look at my shoes, says, sorry mate, rules are rules, I can't let you in. You just stay cool. I just stay cool. I just stay cool. I don't know why, but I just stay cool. So I'm no Casanova. I can't kick a ball, and they won't let me in because I just ain't cool. Thank you. Now, when when you're a kid. Um, Adults ask you the strange question, uh, which is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, so many things wrong with the way that that question is phrased. Uh, I'm not even going to go into it. Um, but I wanted to be everything in the world. And I, and I thought it was perfectly real, realistic that I could achieve all of these things. And um, in, in some respects, I still do. Um, and I think that's fine. Having dreams, even if they're not achievable, is an amazing thing. Just having them. Um, and this is called I Want to Be. And this is about the limitations, gender limitations, that teachers put on students. It's called the hidden curriculum, like uh, value judgments. And teachers do this all the time. They take their own value judgments, and that becomes what your kid is learning, even if you don't agree with it. And this is called I Want to Be. When I was at school, the teacher asked me what, to, what, what I wanted to be when I mattered. The instant I answered, I started to chatter. I want to be a man of great strength, and great stature. I want to be a safe bet, a safe backer. I want the lingo and patter of Terry Dibbs from Face Jacker. I want to be the world record breaking shelf stacker. I want to be a fierce on the beat, a fat rapper. I want to be a FIFA fat cat like Sepp Blatter. I want to be a highly respected, attentive, safe cracker, a naturally charismatic, attractive black actor. I want to be a semi-professional Pentagon hacker. I want to be a dictator and champion linebacker. I want to be the creator and manipulate matter. I want to be a nurse and make people better. From somewhere in the class, I heard a mean titter. At the teacher's remark, I felt my dream shatter. You can be all those things, apart from the latter. Thank you. Um, I was going to tell like a Zenith Window story. You know, who wants to hear a Zenith Window story? Okay, I'm not going to tell that one. Then. Um, okay, um, one thing um, that has been pointed out to me a lot is that I talk over people, and I'm one of these people who I'm thinking of what to say while someone else is talking, and um, it's the way my brain works. And I do care about what people are saying. It's just uh, my brain just flips all over the place, and. Um, Emma, my lovely fiance, um, says to me that I talk over her, and also she's noticed that I talk over women more than I talk over men. Um, yeah, I know. But part of, part of being, um, having any uh, views on any, anything, any principles, um, you are subject to conditioning, as is everyone else. So don't worry if your principles don't match up with how you live, because being aware of it is how you can change it. This is uh, called The Man Who Can. You run a bath for my return. I take out the bins. I forget half of all I yearned. You remember little things. You have the eye, the finer touch. I engage in Fovist art, laying roads down with my brush, so fervent in my marks, that sometimes I brush over you. I'm the king of selfish bores. And while I'm voicing my confusions, you are left with yours. I want to be the one who chooses not to interrupt, 
I want to be your loving Lucas, the man who can shut up. <laughs> One thing I noticed about, um, I see like, because I teach at an all-boys school, so I see like um, this sort of uh, hyper-masculinity. So it's like people aren't in touch with who they are deep down, or they're still questioning it, and they're still finding out who they are. So because they don't want to be seen as not a man, they, they say all these things that they think makes them look like a man to prove it. And it's a load of shit, and I, I tell them it is, not in that language, but I tell them it is, they don't listen. Um, but um, also, like, you think boys would grow out of it. The men I've been working with, they're lovely men, but they're pretty much the same, and it's sort of lads on tour type attitude. And um, in, in, in not colluding in that, you, you risk being chucked out of the man club. And once you're out of the man club, it's very difficult to back, get back in. And this, this idea of the man club, of like, you're good enough to be in it, you know. And it's, 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 it's fucking ridiculous. Like, in, in today's, like, today it's just, it shouldn't happen anymore, I don't think. And the way you talk to someone, regardless of gender, should be the same that, the way that they are with everyone. It shouldn't be, you know, I'm going to treat you like this because you look this way, blah, blah, blah. It's just horseshit. So I'm rambling. <laughs> This is called Man About Town, and I, was, I wrote this when I was going through this crisis of feeling that I wasn't of any substance, um, and I was comparing myself to other people in my family, and I thought that they'd achieved things and learned skills, they, they had knowledge that I felt I didn't have. And at that point, I wrote this, and it's called Man About Town. I've spent so much time reflecting on the lives of everyone else. I think it's time to turn the mirror around and have a look at myself. I don't really do anything. I work in retail. I fantasise in detail over every passing female and every now and then I like to slip one my email. I stay up until the early hours watching Metropolis, talking bollocks to friends about politics who don't really know what it is so they just swallow it. I claim to be a socialist because I read an article about Karl Marx once and I understood most of it. I'm the man about town, yo, I'm the toast of it. I know I might boast a bit, they say I'm too big for my boots, but these toes ain't supposed to fit. It's all just an act to detract from a distinct lack of knowledge. Seven years at college and I'm still uneducated, but at least I'm honest. In this epidemic of slapidemics, I need to stand out from the crowd and actually know what I'm talking about. Because the gaps in my knowledge are like cracks in the pavement. And I trip myself up on these inconcrete statements. I don't like the rules, but I don't try and change it. I think it's time to check my method. Because talking about a revolution sounds like a broken record. See? I can make a pop culture reference. I can turn a catchy phrase or two with very little effort. But once the style is stripped away, there's really nothing left. I'll go away. I'll work on it. I'll read a book or two. I'll come back and write with much more depth. But for now... This will have to do. Thank you. The side of my finger keeps on, as I'm holding this, keeps on tapping the, the screen and it keeps on zooming up and down. Have to not do that. Um, okay, so I can't fit everything I want to say about the subject into 25 minutes. It's just not possible. Um, but one thing I do want to talk about is the pressure that people have to be a certain way. Uh, men, I, I, as a man, I feel a huge amount of pressure to succeed, to provide, to shut up and get on with it. It's a very big one. Um, and this, this comes from everywhere. I feel, I feel personal pressure. If other people don't, I, I get that, but I do. And this is called Be a Man. It's quite heavy, so I'm, I'm warning you. For the, for the right reasons. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Go to work, pay the bills, make the kill, take the meat. 
Show your worth, stand up tall, never fall, never sleep. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Close your eyes, bury pain, sever ties, never weep. Take the strain, the abuse, push it down, swallow truth. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Take the blame, say sorry, you'll find solace in your solitude. Make a plan, follow through, become a numb and hollow you. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Grow a hard, protective skin. Panic when it's wearing thin. Hide emotions from your kin. Learn to never let them in. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Man, know your mind, mind your own. Own your actions, act alone. Know your mind, mind your own. Own your actions, act alone. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Pay your debts, build a name, gain respect, play the game, break the sweat, pull your weight, watch your step. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Don't let them spot that you are inept. Be careful not to lose respect, you useless wreck, you neutered, feckless, henpeck, foolish, putrid wretch. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Put a noose around your neck. Slowly as you tip the chair, feel the stretch, teeter on the very edge. Be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man, be a man. Thank you. At this point in the show, because I was, the whole, this whole show came with images of what I was talking about. And at this point, um, it was going to sort of cut to an image um, that's poignant to me, which is a picture of my, um, I called him my little uncle. He was, he was my, um, he was my, he was my stepdad's brother's, my step-uncle's um, wife's half-brother. And he had a very difficult upbringing um, in South London. Um, and my, um, my aunt-in-law um, adopted him, and, and, and my uncle and my aunt brought, brought him up. And um, I, I, I really got on with him, like, but they seemed to be like this, he was a joker. Like, I, I, could, could you humour me? Could, like, everyone who's got a collar, could you just turn your collar up? That'd be great. If you've got a collar, just turn it up, just pop the collar. Pop it. I can see you, pop it. Yeah, pop the collar. Okay. Some people have done it. And th this is what he used to do. And he used to wear, you know like those caps that they bend, like the, the, the bend them almost so they're like in a circle. And he used to wear one of those caps. And he was, he was really Jack the Laddish. But when it came to talking about anything about him, he, suddenly the jokes would come out and he wouldn't want to talk about it because that was the way he was raised. You don't talk about that sort of stuff. I was really lucky to be brought up in a slightly different way. And, and I felt like I had privileges that he didn't. I was allowed to talk about things. I was allowed to express myself. He wasn't. And um, the last conversation I ever had with him was uh, my um, aunt's mother's funeral. And I get really bad. People don't know this because I come across as quite confident. But I have really, um, like, quite, some, sometimes quite bad social anxiety. And so I went up to him because I was the only one representing my family there. I felt a bit alone. Went up to him and I said, I'm, I'm feeling really like, stressed out and, and I, I feel like I can't talk to people. I have nothing to say. And he said, he said to me, he put his arm around me and he said, like, how long have I known you? He said, we've known each other for, for ages. He said, I'm your little uncle. He's younger than me. But he said, he said, I'm your little uncle and I'm here to watch out for you. And he said, I'm with you now and it's all going to be okay. And I felt like fine for the, rest of that, for the rest of that day. I felt really good. And, and he helped me a lot. And um, I really like, wish I could have been there to help him. Because on Christmas Day, when I was with Emma's family, I was um, sat eating dinner and I got a call saying that he'd tried to hang himself and that he, um, he was in intensive care. And then the next day I heard that he was dead. And I just, I just really wish that he... I hadn't seen him for like two years and I really... Looking back on it, I just really wish that I'd known he was struggling and, uh, and reached out to him and spoken to him. If, if not to say anything, just to listen. Because I think that he, he needed that. He must have felt so alone to, just, to do something like that. And um, yeah, it's, that's the reason why I've done this set is because I feel that men, especially men, um, also, also women, but especially men, feel, because of society, that they can't talk about their issues, they can't say what's bugging them, they can't say what's upsetting them. And this is damaging, and it, it is the reason why that suicide is the highest rate of deaths in adults under the age of 40, and this is a massive problem. And um, so if, if you have anyone in your life that you feel is struggling, uh, regardless of gender, 
and uh, speak to them and, 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 and just, just sit and just listen because you could be, you could be I don't want to be like uh, trite, but you could be saving their lives. I, I wish I'd done that. Um, this next poem, and the one I will end on, is uh, one called Real Boy. And this is about the importance um, as human beings to be open and honest about how we're feeling. Real boy. My fiancé calls me Pinocchio. And we laugh because we both know the story. I lit a fire. I made the way of sneeze, but somehow got snapped on a tooth. They say that a boy needs to roll in the ashes before he can be a man. I'm still finding soot in pleats and embers in breast pockets. Sometimes when I speak to people I get nervous. Nervous of judgement, of being inadequate. But then I notice a trail of dust behind them and I know I'm not alone. Thank you.